Let me jump in, Niles, because you, you and Rajan have, have both been making the point that the, these spectacular failures, which I think your opponents concede, happened and were failures and were spectacular, uh, are, are, are damaging to the organization's reputation. But I want to I bring Mahmoud into the conversation as well to respond to some of, some of what you're hearing and what would your, your pushback be? Because I, I heard you in your opening, Mahmoud, saying that what the organization needs is reform, and that it, which would imply that you believe that it is reformable, uh, so that that you you do not see these failures as fatal to the operation of the organization's mission or reputation. Exactly, not at all. I and mean, I think precision and nuance is very important here. The, the the notion of something irrelevant and obsolete, as we said, which is the heart of the motion, and we need to keep coming back to this because that is the question that is being asked is really something that does not apply to the United Nations when we look at the mandate, as we said, and we look at the history. Uh, if we go with this notion that something is not working because someone is, is getting in the way, again, the Security Council, yet yeah, has been going on for even more than 20, 25 years, but so what? It's because there is political uh, pressure on this. And the elephant in the room at the United Nations, which everyone knows about, is that great power politics, which, by the way, would be coming back even more uh, sort of strongly if we remove the United Nations, as we've seen already the sort of the trend taking place since the mid 2010s uh, with the Trump administration, the Putin administration, we've seen this around the world as well. Now, in any one of these cases, it's because some of these missions were prevented from uh, working in that way. And in fact, interestingly, Rwanda is not so obviously a failure of the UN as it is the evidence is there that it was the Clinton administration and then some of the European powers and some of the African nations that were not interested in going there at the time. The people on the ground have written extensively about this. The Canadian head of the mission, his Ghanaian deputy, the Senegalese fellow that died there. Evidence is that these people actually went there because there was a United Nation, that there was this mission. And then yes, politics, uh, bureaucracy, as I said, and all of this prevented this. The question of the genocide is also a little bit too easy. The two biggest genocides of the 20th century took place before the United Nations, the Holocaust and Armenia. So if it's simply the question of, 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 of genocides, yes, they could happen, but they could also happen outside of this. And I want to go back to this notion of something obsolete for the third time. If we say that something is not working, then we need to so quickly get rid of it. Well, this would apply to all of the problems that we have with statehoods. How many states in the world are not functioning so easily? Corporations, bad civil society that would have politics, the school system that is not working. So the concept here is that we have the one organization that is certainly not doing so well. I grant that and I highlight that because it's a matter of intellectual honesty and because it's, it, we can all see it but the one organization that has been designed that countries could go to as they are. And let us remember how in the 60s, that we mentioned history here, how these young nations, look, the Algerians took their case to the UN against colonial France, as it is, in the hope that that one organization would solve it, as it is. And so this notion of having a space, a forum, where these issues need to be addressed, and a forum, yes, that is in need of reform, absolutely count me in on that, including on the Security Council, is, I think, the important point in this conversation.